Okay, we are just past 12 noon, and I always believe in rewarding the prompt. My name is Catherine Carlton. I'm Executive Director of Orchestras Canada, Orchestre Canada, and it's my delight and my honor to welcome you to today's Resilient Ontario Orchestras Festival of Learning session number three. Uh, this is content that has been taken from successful projects that have been undertaken by consultants paired up with orchestras right across the province to work on challenges identified by the orchestras and uh, through an intense uh, kind of consultation engagement. And while it's wonderful that there's been an opportunity for the work to be done by skilled consultants working with wonderful clients, we thought that the greatest value was came from sharing the experiences and sharing the learnings from individual consultations. Um, the entire project has been made possible by the Ontario Trillium Foundation through their Resilient Ontario Communities Fund. You know, at Orchestras Canada, we're continually tasking ourselves with the question of how best to be helpful to uh, orchestras. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we obviously had some thinking to do about how best to do that. Fortunately, Trillium was there. Uh, they were really interested in a proposal to um, select orchestras with specific challenges, uh, assign consultants to work with them, and then monitor what happened uh, over the course of these engagements. Uh, so great thanks to Trillium for seeing the value of the project and for getting it going. I'd also like to acknowledge the 23 participating orchestras, the 21 participating consultants, our steering committee, Maggie Goldsmith, Matthew Jones, Eileen Kuhn, Leanne Luton, Roy Takiesu, and Sandra Weeks, our lead consultant, and my colleagues at Orchestras Canada, Lauren Drew and Boran Zaza. Now, um, I think I got the order wrong. Um, I will say that I'm speaking to you today from Peterborough, Ontario, also called Nogojiwanong, the place at the end of the rapids. Um, every day I wake up in this community, I am grateful for the stewardship, the care, and the leadership of our Indigenous peoples on this land, the Michisage Anishinaabek, uh, who have long uh, been on this land and have tended it uh, with such great care and fidelity. I express my gratitude to them and my uh, desire to honor their teachings in my daily life and work. I am a sh newly uh, shorn, uh, silver-haired white woman uh, in her late 50s. I'm not wearing my glasses today. Uh, and we're doing these visual descriptions as a way of helping people who may be low vision um, identify who they're hearing speak at different points during the session. Um, with those acknowledgements in place and with that description, I now want to hand the mic over to my colleague, Lauren Drew. Uh, and Lauren will run you through the technical details. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Drew, Director of Member Services and Learning for OC. My pronouns are she, her. Um, my visual description, I am a white woman in my 20s with long uh, brown hair and black glasses. Behind me is a white wall with a green and white Trent University degree. Um, and I'm wearing a plain black sweater. I'm also joining you today from Nogajiwanong, Peterborough, on the Treaty 20 Michisagi territory and the traditional territory of the Michisagi and Chippewa nations. Um, I'm very grateful to have grown up in this area and still be working here. Um, thank you very much. Um, so just a few notes on the tech logistics. Please keep your video and audio muted. We are recording the session. Um, you can use the chat throughout. So we'll be putting a few discussion prompts in there, uh, but we also encourage you to type your questions for speakers in the chat, and we'll have about 10 minutes for question and answer at the end. Um, we're pleased to offer English closed captioning services from rev.com, and I'll paste some instructions in the chat on how to enable that. Um, and again, we are recording. We'll be sharing the recording as well as some written resources, including the PowerPoint with you in the coming weeks. So watch your email inbox for that. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to our wonderful presenters. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicole Fowler. I'm sitting at a wooden desk in a white chair with a white wall behind me and a hanging tapestry. I'm wearing a purple shirt. I am a marketing uh, strategy uh, communications consultant currently working in Take Toronto, uh, presently named Toronto. 
in the neighborhood of Parkdale, the current treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit of First Nation, in the sacred territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabeg people. I am really grateful to live on this land and appreciate organizations who take action uh, to ensure Indigenous peoples and communities are acknowledged and heard. Uh, it is an honor to be a part of this project. Uh, thanks to Orchestras Canada and the Ottawa Chamber Orchestra uh, Board for being so collaborative and creative uh, in this project. <laughs> we had a really fun summer um, as we struggle, uh, as we all struggle with resilience, uh, I think, and all that means um, in the performing arts. So today we're gonna to talk about the Ottawa Chamber Orchestras. I will for, refer to them going forward as OCO, um, their journey over the past few months uh, in regard to planning marketing communications for the year. And we hope you do have some thoughts to share as well. As Lauren mentioned, there's a Q&A at the end. Uh, we invite you to put questions into the chat and to uh, consider some of the questions that we're gonna put in there as well uh, as we move along. So with that, I invite Julie to say hello. Hi, so my name is Julie Dunn. Uh, I play the clarinet in the orchestra and I am also a board member. Uh, I take care of marketing for the orchestra. I am a music teacher too. Um, I am wearing today my favorite lime green shirt and I am in a spare bedroom in my, in my home that has gray walls. And I have a beautiful window that's uh, putting light on my face today as I speak to you. Uh, I am in Gatineau, or more specifically Elmer in Quebec, and I am grateful to raise my family to work and play in the non-ceded land of the Anishinaabewaki people. My name is Kathy, or Catherine, as you wish, Red Cell. Today I'm joining you from Kingston, Ontario, situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. I am grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. I'm sitting in my living room in Kingston, overlooking some beautiful yellow-leafed maple trees. I have shoulder-length hair and wearing a blue striped blouse. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. So today, uh, we just I'll give you a bit of the, the overview of how we're, how we're going to um, present today. Uh, Kathy is going to set the stage um, for uh, what, what happened and what was to come. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the planning process and then Julie is going to walk you through um, how it's actually being executed um, today, uh, presently. So Kathy. All right, I come here today to speak to you about how our orchestra changed our planning processes in marketing and performing. I am on the board and a playing member on French horn for the Ottawa Chamber Orchestra. A year ago, during earlier COVID times, the Ottawa Chamber Orchestra came together as a new board and began to try to figure out if, when, and how do we return playing as an orchestra and marketing ourselves. It was a challenge to even conceive ideas to bring the orchestra together. As a group, we did try plan, but were continually canceling during the stringent COVID rules. We continued to try and keep a presence online, and we're working on an online concert with the strings last spring. In the past for the concerts, our main marketing strategy was posters, which a volunteer of the orchestra did. Things were usually done in a great hurry, just prior to concerts, a real pressure time. Tickets were sold by orchestra members and at the door and usually family and friends. The orchestra board prepared the tickets, venue and marketing, all jobs that require are required to produce a concert. As volunteers on the board, we each had roles to play and a view for each problem as it came in. We have the usual positions of presidents, finance, marketing, secretary, and personnel manager. Mine has become to monitor information from Orchestras Canada as we discover how much relevant support is available. Our president of the Ottawa Chamber Orchestra is Dave Wojcicki, He's particularly able to motivate the group into action by telling us about all the jobs and concerns that come up. This captures our interests so we all participate in getting things done. Dave motivates us to actively assist to help solve the problems by being very positive and keeps on asking questions, which generates ideas. 
He has called for short one-hour meetings more frequently, which are active and produce results. Dave has also made contact with other orchestras to assist in a friendly exchange of ideas, exchange marketing plans, and dates of concerts. As a board then, we had cohesiveness, energy, action, ideas, but not an overall evidence-based marketing plan and a return to playing plan. To begin this marketing plan, to become more financially stable, and to increase our presence online, we needed to see what others were doing and what ideas worked. Our challenging challenge for marketing was to design and implement marketing strategies that incorporated the traditional ones and increased our focus on digital media. We needed to attract an audience from a broader demographic market. We had to make marketing easier and have more people involved. We needed to have up-to-date expertise on how. The issue of marketing was huge for one person and a few helpers. It was difficult to present to get volunteers without a clear organized plan. If you don't have a plan, it's hard to see how you can fit in. More people will join in when they can see a way of contributing and time to contribute. I began the process of changing our past concert strategies by applying for the Resilient Ontario Orchestras project, which the Ottawa Chamber Board was able to write together. An exciting process which showed how the new board was able to work together to write a winning grant application. Our step to join Orchestras Canada turned out to be a serious turning point in returning from the pandemic. Any questions we had on when to return, how to implement pandemic measures, how to ensure safety of all, were all answered as we came up with the questions. We were amazed at the timeliness of answers, which we had not posed to Orchestras Canada, but arrived, arrived in my inbox by magic, I'm sure it was. They provided information from the government websites and information OC had created. There was one week an email arrived titled, The Future of Digital Orchestra, Impact and Sustainability, just as we were trying to figure out about digital orchestras. There was one, COVID-19 screening for organizations, assess, accessing rapid antigen tests through the Ontario Together website. There was the Ontario Roadmap, step one, to reopen. There was reopening your orchestra and COVID-19 workplace safety plans. Good information. It also talked about how to keep the orchestra safe, and let potential audience know how we are making the concert safe for them to come, which would encourage them to come, I'm hoping. Then there was real talk on COVID-19 planning for the fourth wave. With this were surveys to gain present information and Orchestras Canada put it together and published or presented it for us to see. The other step was to obtain the grant for the Resilient Ontario Orchestra Project and have Nicole Fowler as her advisor. Brilliant, it really brought the best out of us. We had lively discussions. Nicole was able to encourage enthusiasm, fun. It was wonderful motivation. It was clear how to contribute. She brought in real ideas of what works and what to focus on. She brought a sense of working on positives, which always reinforces a sense of accomplishment. She was so organized, had insightful plan, and kept us with her all the way. It must have been a bit of a struggle for her, but <laughs> I really enjoyed the sessions and gained so much knowledge about how to market our orchestra oh, and how a masterful leader can lead with so much fun. Energy brought to each session and the positive direction spawned mega ideas. Our guiding questions for the Resilient Orchestra Project will be discussed by Nicole. Nicole, I think you're muted. You knew that was going to happen. Um, so uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, we were a lively group uh, of six. Uh, we met from around June to September. We had four working sessions, uh, each one with a particular focus and an opportunity to uh, share our homework, which everyone had, uh, to brainstorm, to ideate, and to review whatever the focus was for that particular session. 
So we started off, uh, we started with a kickoff, which was an opportunity more for me to get a sense of the team, uh, their very individual perspectives, and to validate the ask of the submission. So this was largely a discussion. Um, it's, it was a way really to start getting um, a sense of what the key priorities would be and the questions that would guide the planning process. So we could start to think about also um, what the outputs would look like. So I'm going to, I'm just sharing my screen here. Uh, so these are the guiding questions. And before we, uh, before I speak to these, we're gonna ask Lauren actually to do a bit of a poll uh, that we can then uh, loop back to at the end. So the poll today is uh, just to know um, very quickly if marketing planning is a part of your orchestra's annual process. So we'll just give a, a bit of time for everybody to uh, share uh, or answer the poll. And then we'll touch uh, back on it through questions uh, at the end. We may need to put the poll back up again. It disappeared before folks could vote. Uh, so hang on for a moment. We're just going to go and see if we can fix this because we want to hear from more than two people. <laughs> Let's, uh, uh, Boran, do you want to take it down and then put it back up again and, and we, can, we can start this one again? Yes, um, I did put it up and I'm not sure why it disappeared and I don't, up oh, there, relaunch poll, there we go. Do folks see it now? There we go. Okay, now now it's ringing in. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this is great. So uh, for everybody answering the poll, and if you if you don't get a chance to, or we again we can touch on it. Uh, we'll touch on it again at the uh, at the end or in Q and A. So we'll just give it thirty more seconds. Mm -hmm. I feel like I should, be, should I be playing music? Maybe I, I could, uh, I could, yeah, we need some music. I'm gonna note that for next time. <laughs> Great, so I'm ending the poll. Thank and you. Sharing the results. Thank you. So um, these are the three guiding questions uh, that you see on the screen that underlie the marketing communications for the OCO this year. So 2021-22. The first question signals a shift from just a focus on performance uh, outreach to a broader uh, context of building community uh, around what an orchestra does, who they are, what's sort of behind the scenes. So as an example, many orchestras have education components. There's obviously the members. Um, audiences are always curious about behind the scenes and how everything gets put together uh, and things like history. So uh, community and community content is particularly uh, important um, since performances, uh, especially in the last two years, haven't had the chance um, to happen regularly. The second question draws out a few things. Uh, again, primarily in a shifting uh, pandemic, how it impacts how we participate uh, with arts and culture. But it can also refer to a broader context or behavioral shift in terms of where and when people want to engage or hear a performance. So prior to um, pandemic, there has just there there have been years now of audiences taste changing or behavioral changes in terms of where they want to be when they hear um, an orchestra, <clears throat> and we've seen a lot of um, you know really innovative and creative ways uh, that orchestras have then um, started to in. Um, interact with audiences, which then leads to a third question. So particularly for the OCO uh, and our sessions, it was how to better leverage and integrate um, their uh, online uh, social media and digital content. So the planning pieces that we ended up uh, using are all on the slide here. I have placed uh, sort of high, uh, like high level um, 
ideas of the key components of each. And we're gonna talk to you about um, all of the pieces. So um, I'm gonna address some of them here and then Julie will continue to show you how they're used in execution. So starting with a communication brief, um, this is just a great starter to really beg a lot of questions that we use this, uh, we used a brief format at our very first kickoff. <laughs> and it really, um, it really just fosters a whole bunch of things, whether it's, you know, questions or challenges, uh, what's what sticks, what's working, where the gaps might be, and what you need to validate potentially in terms of who you are. So what I like to call the DNA of an orchestra, um, whether that is your profile, uh, the perceptions that an audience might have or what you think they are, um, and then how all of that positioning works um, from a communications perspective. So once a brief is finalized, you can use that as a baseline document for the entire year uh, and for any future projects um, that it can be adapted on. So. As an example, if you have your baseline brief with these core components of who you are and what uh, who your audiences are and what your value is, if you were to say, then build a new website, <laughs> you would add that project on tactically with all of its elements to your brief. So then again, the whole team has a, a document to sort of work to and also refer to, um, to make sure it's all laddering up um, and staying consistent with what you output throughout the year. So following that, the B is a communications plan. So this is taking, uh, taking the brief a little further into the how um, and more details to the plan itself. So how, what, are, what is it that we're going to achieve? How are we gonna make that happen? Um, it might include some creative ideas or creative elements um, that are going to be incorporated in communications for the year. Uh, it might uh, include high level timing. So the communications plan, uh, we're gonna show you a bit of this, as well as the playbook. So a sort of a core, uh, core subject uh, in today's presentation, the playbook really takes uh, the how um, and it's all about the what. So the, the playbook um, that we'll show you a snapshot of is the OCO's guide uh, this year for the approach, uh, the themes that we ended up choosing, topics, platforms, and how they are executing uh, the ideas and key components. The calendar, uh, I am not gonna touch on because Julie's gonna talk about that and show you how it works. Um, the one thing I will say, uh, probably like a proud, proud moment <laughs> in our working sessions and in this experience was that we all know uh, we can put together as many documents as we wanna put together, but how do we know if they work? So part of our process was actually to uh, one of our sessions is um, involved. The board team took away uh, the communications calendar by the time we got there. And then their homework was to come back in the final session and present back to me. So it was an amazing um, check in to see are the pieces actually working? Like, are they going to be useful um, by the, the team that is going to use them, obviously, to execute? So uh, I can say that the ideas were just amazing um, and it was really uh, gratifying um, and useful to see um, that it was working or what had to be tweaked and adjusted um, to make it even better. So here's a snapshot of a communications. Oh, I'm just going to show you a few pages of, a, of their communication plan uh, goals. You know, the main thing here is just ensuring that they're achievable. Uh, we all know everybody on this um, this webinar today probably understands more than anyone else how time, budget, and resources are just a constant, constant challenge. So in the when we talked about the goals, it was. Con, uh, always a review to simplify, keep them achievable. And what, what are the priorities? There's a hundred things that we want to do, but really what can we land on um, and what can we action on for the year? So following that is, uh, okay, so how can we make these happen? Um, and with the objectives, I think the key thing, uh, there was two sort of key things. One was um, use what's already what you have so building things from scratch from a timing perspective and resourcing is is very difficult so are there things that we can use um and adapt that will already that will work help us uh but sorry that will help us achieve our goals and then secondly i think a, a really key component here too is an integrated communications plan so digital, as we know, has been around for decades. I am pre-Google. I still have the strongest passion for digital that I had then as I do now. I love it. I'm a 100% believer. 
But I also know that to achieve um, really good engagement is you have to have an integrated plan. So the person who might be online 99% of the time still might go out to get a tea and see a poster somewhere uh, about your event. So the strength is really in how, where you can be, where, like how you can reach people wherever they are at any time of day. So part of the experience um, that that ties to is what journey can you anticipate your audiences might take or what actions might they take? So the, again, this was part of our uh, working session to just flush out um, as close as we could, imagine a list of what our audience is going to do and how we can keep them in mind when we are producing communications. I say we like I'm a part of this team and I just wanna say I was a part, but they're really doing all the work now. So <laughs> when I say we, I, I'm taking that liberally. So all this means is that somebody might hear about the OCO, they might buy a ticket and become a regular supporter. That's the like, that's the gold, <laughs> that's the gold standard. But there are many other ways that somebody might start and then become involved um, and interact with your orchestra. So it does help to have a to have this list and then tie it to the things that you're doing um, in order to track, but then also you know innovate in terms of how you reach them um, or think about what their behavior might be. So somebody might just randomly see a post um, in their Facebook feed and then uh, share it with someone um, who might be interested in coming to a performance. So myriad of ways um, that you can sort of think about the path and then execute that uh, from a communication standard. So uh, there, you can't read anything on the screen here. So I am the only purpose, I'm just showing you uh, how a playbook is laid out. It's really a series of pages. Um, based on, as I mentioned, the priorities, the ideas, um, and the, the sort of best practice sort of reminders um, that we thought were important um, for the execution uh, of communications this year. So a snapshot um, of the table of contents for OCO's playbook is here. So this is uh, content and themes, you can see them all. But I also want to um, mention that, you know, there's very specific elements um, to an orchestra. So um, in OCO's case, it's bilingual um, posts. So the, those had to be considered. And we talked about how we're going to do that, how it's going to be resourced. Um, what are some different ways that you can message in um, more than one language to keep it, again, simple and effective? Uh, localizing listings and media, of course, is always very specific. And then uh, again, a key thing, a key part of this process was uh, doing an audit. So part of my role right from the get-go was doing an audit and finding what works. And I can 100%, anyone can come to me, if you think you need to start things from scratch, I will challenge it and say, no, I bet there's great stuff there, already there, let's, let's look. So um, all this to say, uh, we're showing this post in particular because it's a great example of what was working. It had all the key elements in terms of messaging. The creative was on brand, very clean, one photograph. Um, in, a, in a state where we always have to do a lot ourselves, I would say visuals rarely add more to the message. So um, it's best to keep it super simple, super clean, um, use the, the great photography um, if you have it. So I'm going to pause there because we are at the point where um, Julie is going to walk you through uh, how this all gets put into play and how it gets executed um, day to day as we as we speak. Thanks, Nicole. So um, we're going to talk about peaks and valleys. Uh, these are a concept or this is a concept that is uh, pretty much where, where we guide our whole season. So the peaks would be the equivalent of when our performances arrive. Um, so that's when we're doing a lot of posting and a lot of promotion for our events or for our concerts in our case. And the valleys would be all of the times uh, in between performances where we're usually rehearsing ourselves, but we still wanna stay engaged with our audience. So uh, the first thing we, we do uh, is uh, use the playbook and outline our season in our calendar. So we put in all of our concert dates and other events uh, awareness days as well uh, that are uh, relevant to, to what we do or what we're going to be doing and we build up to the performance. So in the valleys, uh, we fill in the gaps with new content that we create 
uh, even though we have a lot that we already have that we can use, but we can create some like uh, member profiles. So profiles from members of our orchestra uh, that talk about themselves and say who they are, what instrument they play, uh, why they love to play in our orchestra and, and just post these on, on our social media pages so that uh, people get to know us at, because we are a community orchestra and that uh, people feel like, hey, you know, like we have things in common and, you know, we're, we're part of a community together. Uh, we also have composer milestones um, that touch our repertoire. So whatever re repertoire we are playing, we're going to try and find key things about composers or the piece or to tie into our calendar. And uh, we have pictures and video and content that we have from previous uh, events. And also um, we have memories as well from uh, our social media. So um, sometimes in our whole season changes may occur or sometimes we there's information that is missing things that we don't know yet. Um, so what is the great thing about having a, a calendar or a communications calendar is that you see your whole season in one glance and you know where your peaks are where your valleys are and then where you can adjust and what needs to be done so that it, it flows better um, and you keep the content fresh too you're not uh, posting you know the same type of of things over and over again and you can bury and you know where you're going and where you came from as well um, so whenever we post or publish in the OCO's name, we make sure to keep our tone and image uh, that resemble us as an ensemble. So it's kind of like a brand. Um, we are we integrate this in our website that is currently under construction, by the way. <laughs> we're working hard on that as we speak <laughs> um, because we're sort of using this time to rebrand ourselves uh, with what we've learned. And uh, so, yeah, so our website is kind of under construction, but we're getting there. Uh, and we use on our social media and art as well. And we make sure to touch awareness days that are in line with what we do. They're not random. We don't choose just any awareness day like International Coffee Day if it has nothing to do with what, what we're doing. So we make sure that our posts are, <laughs> are relevant. So uh, here's a look at uh, what a communications calendar can look like. This is like the broad version, like the, 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 the for the whole season. So um, it, it, this is just a glimpse, by the way. Uh, so you can see that uh, all of the months are spread out uh, into seasons. So summer, fall, winter, and spring. And then we have in uh, our main uh, I guess, awareness days, events, uh, performances, and uh, we put those in first, and then we, we sort of look at what, where we need to fill in. So this gives us a good idea of what we, we have to work with. Uh, it gives us an idea of where our rushes are, so closer to the performances, and then where the, the valleys are as well. So where we need to put in some content that can be to keep us alive and, and, and uh, seen by our public and and people that might want to to get to know us better as well so uh how do we put all of this into practice well what we do is we work together on a collaborative document so uh we search and add content especially for the um uh the content bank so whatever we can find out on different composers or uh, like for the composer milestones and we put it all in one document anyone can act well anyone from the board uh, can access it and uh, we can just sort of pick and choose from there so we don't have to do all of the work at the last minute we have a bank of ideas and we can use it for every season and we can fill it up anytime and it's always there for us to use um so uh we or and this is for awareness days uh or any other ideas that we may have uh, so they're in a content uh, bank, yep, and it makes it easy for uh, interesting facts and ideas to post during the valleys, yep, so during the valleys. Um, so then what happens is uh, Kate, we, another board member, um, and I, what we do is we map out a specific marketing calendar for our, uh, let's say, our concert blog. Um, so what we do is um, we uh, put out important dates and deadlines. So deadlines for newspapers, um, whatever it could be, like press releases, and then different posts we want to put in, reminders as well. Uh, all that is put in 
into our calendar and then we make sure that everything goes out when it's supposed to go out so that again we can plan ahead and we're not sort of running after time and trying to figure out what to do when and just sort of put out anything we can find it's organized and it's uh it's easy to find and it's um it's planned. That's the best thing. It's planned. And you can plan it when you have time, not at the last minute. Um, so after what we do is we create content that is adaptable for the website, uh, social media and print as well. So uh, we start by uh, creating a sort of like a text a description of the event coming up. So for example, it could be repertoire, um, uh, soloists, whatever it may be. And we work from there to, to sort of figure out the main idea of, of our uh, concert or our presentation. And uh, so then we work with the same materials uh, and we create new things from there. So we start with the text, the description, and then create stuff that we use in all of our different uh, medias. Uh, we always make sure that it sticks to uh, the image that we're trying to portray or our OCO brand, if I can say. Uh, so it goes from colors, fonts, logos, and always the way we interact. So tone, feeling, clarity, all of those things are important. Um, we have another collaborative document that we use that is sent out to the members of the orchestra. Uh, this document um, is uh, sort of like an order sheet for uh, posters. So we've been doing posters for a while now, and um, we noticed that a lot of our members do take them, but uh, they end up in the recycle bin because it's not organized. So people don't really know where to post them. They'll post one or two at work and then that's done. But there are key places in our city where we can uh, post our, our, our posters that we work hard on. So I mean, we want them to be seen. Um, so what we, we do now is we have a document where we can put in key places where we absolutely want our posters to be posted and members of the orchestra can write their name and say okay I'll go here I'll go there I need you know this amount of posters and then anybody can add any other spot that they want or they feel that they can do or that is closer to their home their work whatever it may be and that way we have a great idea of where we need to maybe put more or where they're all going or are, are we using them all and then print out just the amount we need. So um, after that, well, let's have a look at what our calendar uh, looks like for our first block. So this is what's uh, on the screen now. So our uh, first concert block uh, was originally supposed to be from September to October 30th, uh, but we've had a little setback. We've had to move the concert date. So it is now on December 18th. So as you can see, there are two performance dates. Um, so what we do generally, and this is what we do every single time, it's always the same process. So we start from our performance uh, date, and then we put in everything that needs to be done closest to that performance date. So going to the peak. So for example, in December, uh, we have concert reminders uh, the week before. Oh, you know, don't forget to come tomorrow. And then the, the day of, hey, tonight we're having our concert. Don't forget to come. And then the follow up the next day. But the whole build up to get there is uh, filled with what I was talking uh, about before. So um, awareness days. So for example, October uh, 1st was International Music Day. So, uh, well, I mean, it's we're an orchestra, so it kind of felt natural to put that in there, but it has greater significance for our ensemble because um, the founder of International Music Day is Yehudi Menuhin, and he was actually our conductor's uh, violin teacher. So that was kind of like an interesting angle to go on, and uh, it gave it more value to our ensemble than maybe any other ensemble, and it creates just a little link that people get to know our ensemble and our conductor our great conductor so that was great it was like uh two checks in one post it was perfect um so then we have composer milestones uh so we don't necessarily write it in if we well this was taken when we didn't know what we were going to post yet but we know we knew we wanted to do it there and then uh well we had to you know we had a, a, a deeper valley to, to fill in this time because we moved the concert date. So uh, we, we filled it up with member profiles in November. Um, and then we had 
whatever uh, videos, uh, audio, uh, pictures, even from our current um, rehearsals. So we're, we're getting ready to, to perform uh, on, in December. So we're rehearsing, right? So people like to see behind the scenes. And so taking little pictures or videos of us rehearsing and saying, hey guys, we're working hard on whatever, a little ball mountain. Come have a listen when we're all done and ready in December. It, it keeps people, um, excited about what we're doing and we're excited too so that's fun so that's pretty much what it looks like and this is what we do every single time it's super important that uh, uh we touch on everything and especially that we get everything going for our our peaks because that's when we want people to come so next is sort of like our checklist so as i was saying um or yeah, well, sort of. <laughs> um, every time we do a performance, the objective is to be seen as much as possible, right? So in the most areas possible, not only on social media, not just uh, TV or a website or whatever, posters, it has to be everything because as Nicole was saying you never know the person that was on Facebook 99% of the time might not have seen you but they go out for tea or they go out to buy reeds for their instrument or whatever it may be and then they see a poster and they say oh that's interesting so it's about a whole a whole uh, ensemble of things so well, as I said earlier, what we do is we write a description of the event. Uh, so the program, if there are soloists, the theme, and we use this text to guide everything. So when we write our press releases, it's all based on the first main idea, the description of our performance, our concert. And then we, we you know, sort of modify it to go uh, for social media, posters, whatever we publish. Uh, so we create art to go with the description. So, for example, if we have a Halloween concert or if we have a New Year's concert, well, the, the feeling isn't going to be the same. The artwork isn't going to be the same. So we adapt it to the performance, the specific performance that we're, uh, we're doing or we're working on. And um, so after that, well, we publish on or we post on social media, we create an event. And we ask all of our members to share and invite people to the event. And so, um, but we also encourage people to go back to our website. So everything we 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 use as a promotion uh, material, so what it, whether it be posters or whatever, it always, always, always drives back to our website every time. And that's where all of the information is available and where you can buy tickets as well. Um, so another thing we've started to do a couple of years ago uh, before COVID uh, is we started to cross promote with other ensembles of the area. So there are a lot of uh, different uh, ensembles, music ensembles here in Ottawa and in Gatineau as well. And uh, we started to have cross promotion. So what we would do is say, okay, well, we have a concert in December. You have one in November. How about we, you know, share your event for your concert and then maybe you can do the same for our concert and then we reach more and more people that have the same interests so that's one way to go about it um, and uh, it, it doesn't cost anything it's just a click it's easy uh, we could do the same thing with posters or uh, with uh, print so we could ask them to have a leaflet in, in their program or something uh, and we could do the same for them for another concert um, I mean it's it's it depends on the ensembles. It depends on what everybody's doing. But uh, that's something that really, really helped us in the past and that we're still going to do uh, now and that we can integrate into our calendar as well. Um, so uh, the content uh, can also be sent by email. Uh, so that's one thing that we have also, uh, an email database. And um, yeah, so we ask our members to put out posters in different areas and... Uh, yeah, so we always, always, always do it in the same way for every concert. That way we're sure that our checklist is all said and done. Everything is there. We're not missing anything. We're not last minute and it's organized. So uh, it's all about community outreach as well. Um, so one of the best ways to get more people to hear us play is by building community, right? So we are a community orchestra after all. So I guess it's kind of natural. 
Um, so we want to make sure we are seen in as many different ways uh, as possible to touch a wider demographic. So using the posters in key places and word, word of mouth to our friends and family has been up till now a good way to go. But going forward, uh, we'll be working more on our online presence to make the OCO community grow. So we are working hard presently on revamping our website um, to make it easier to navigate and more eye-pleasing. Uh, and this is the base of our contact with our community. So it needs to be up to date on brand and appealing. That's super important. That's why we're spending time doing it right so that it's done well and we can use it. <laughs> it's a long process, but it's getting there. Uh, we follow our calendar uh, to make sure our social media is updated and on point. We cross promote when possible and try to have something new every second week that we post on our social media, including anything that's in our calendar. And sometimes there's even new content that can pop up. So we've had this happen just last month. Um, two years ago, we worked with a composer uh, uh, she had composed music that we uh, played um, and uh, she posted on, on her social media like, oh, the OCO is playing this piece and come and have a listen and this and that. And she was super happy about it. And it showed up as a memory in her her feed uh, again, like this year. It's, oh, two years ago today, this happened. So she reposted it and tagged us in her in her post. So that filled our little valley here, like perfectly. We didn't have to think about anything. Uh, and, and, and she posted it and it got seen by everybody in her circle and our circle. And it, it, it's just super easy. So when you start creating community like that, um, then everybody starts to sort of collaborate together without even knowing and without even having to do much effort really. So um, in our concert, in our calendar, we also have deadlines for press releases uh, for TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines. And these are a great way to get people talking about the OCO and invite them to our concerts, of course. So another way we, we uh, work is, um, well, we are very, very, very lucky to have uh, Donnie Deakin as our, our uh, conductor. And he is very invested in music education. And he conducts the Ottawa Youth Orchestra as well. Um, he creates great links between um, the youth in his orchestra or in that orchestra and our ensemble. Um, so our circles sort of collide, but that's a great thing because, you know, like it's not all the same people that come and see all of the same concerts. And um, actually our concert master is uh, one of uh, Donnie's students. So that's really great. So he gets to have great experience and we get to, to, to foster his learning, if we could say, if we could put it that way. And uh, it's, it's very, it's, it's super motivating because you get to see young people doing what they love and what we love as well. And we get to collaborate together and that's great. Um, so uh, we also have many music teachers in the orchestra, uh, me included, and we always try to uh, get our, our students involved uh, as ushers or whatever it may be to, to get them to, to know about us and to see what our orchestra life is like. Um, so we, uh, well, these are the many ways we have to keep in touch with our community and we uh, strive to continue to serve our public and members to produce and offer great music in our region. So I hope you've been able to, there wasn't too fast, I wasn't talking too fast and you got a bit of a glimpse of how that works. So uh, I'm sending it off to Kathy and uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. That was exciting, just the way you spoke about it. <laughs> so we now have a written plan of who we are and what we want to do. This brought useful tools for us to use on files we could all access, access a place to put unsorted ideas for generating ideas, and tools to keep creating. These new resources make marketing easier and faster to get into use. We have a way for all of the board to access and update a single calendar of events. If an idea hits us at two in the morning, for those, um, there is a place to put it for all to see and to be able to use. This is a bank of ideas, not just structure, but content and summary for all of our marketing team to continue building on and continue moving into the future. It is a set of resources assigned to tasks we can easily adapt and pivot as we need. Being part of Orchestras Canada has been a brilliant step to bring our orchestra back to playing safely and having an accessible, user-friendly marketing plan. Thank you.
<laughs> thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Julie. So I think uh, we're at time now for Q&A. Um, we can talk about the results of the poll or Lauren, if you wanna drive, um, just give us a sense of some of the questions. I, I'd happy to stop sharing and we can, we can talk some of them. Okay, great. Uh, folks, if you have any questions, be sure to type them in the chat, um, but a few we can, we can start touching on. Um, so Wendy in the chat has asked about embracing TikTok, but I'm actually going to combine that with one of the challenges that another orchestra expressed earlier, um, and that's cutting through the, the noise of everything in, in the communications environment. There's a lot of channels that people are using, a lot of things that they're seeing. Um, but can you talk a little bit about prioritizing your efforts within that environment um, when you have limited time and resources, but you really want to make sure that you're get, getting people where they are um, in a way that's going to, you know, drive the most return on your time and effort as a small orchestra. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take that one first. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, I, I've worked in digital for a really long time. And, uh, and so it's also a constantly shifting landscape. And I'll say, um, you know, I think a priority comes down to who you're trying to reach and who is most likely to attend your concerts. Kathy mentioned earlier, like a question of growth. And I think a growth strategy can definitely follow along um, in parallel. So you could test things out in a new platform like TikTok to see if there's going to be engagement. But I would also say that um, you don't have to be in all channels. Um, it's just, it really just uh, depends on who, um, who is in there. Um, I, I love them for experimenting, um, but in a lot of cases, I, I would counsel, even if um, let's say an organization isn't highly visual or doesn't have like highly, like a lot of photographs or images or a reason to share them, don't, don't go on Instagram, right? Just because it's there. Uh, because that also relates then to volume and relevance. So you really want to choose, let's say, the key channels um, that you, you think or anticipate are going to work for you. You could also test in a few out of curiosity to, just, to see what works and what doesn't. I mean, marketing is testing. Um, but from a relevance standpoint or volume standpoint, um, 100%. And we had a lot of discussions around this. Um, and I think um, Julie might probably mentioned, made a reference to like National Coffee Day. <laughs> just so... There are a thousand awareness days. There's like millions of conversations happening in the space. You want to choose the ones um, that are most relevant to you and that maybe there's an opportunity to, um, to piggyback on. But then there's a lot of other ones, um, including holiday periods, you know, that are tough. So I, I think in those cases, too, it's, it's just a matter of thinking about the ones that are most likely to work for you and make sense to people um, about why you would be talking um, at any particular time or, or marketing at any particular time about what, you know, about your orchestra. I, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Nicole. And uh, Kathy and Julie, can you just clarify what channels the OCO is prioritizing for, for your digital marketing? Yeah, so we always sort of had a presence on Facebook. I think it was probably the easiest way to go uh, because you can create events and and it, everybody just seemed to sort of be there. Um, but we do have Twitter and uh, Instagram as well. Um, but as I said earlier, all of the, well, this is for posting and, and trying to keep our community alive, but we also have to really work hard on the website because I think that's a super important part because all of our identity and who we really are and all of the information about us is on our website. So posting is great to just to keep us sort of like on top of everybody's mind, I guess, especially when you come up to a peak, but you have to remember that it's not about just posting something and, and saying, Oh, Hey, like uh, Tchaikovsky had cats and we're doing this cat piece and blah, blah. And then that's it. Right. Like that, that's not how that works. So, I mean, it's, it's nice, but it's, it's not everything. Um, I think you also have to have a lot more, um, how can I say, uh, substance into what you're, you're posting and who you are. You have to know about that. That's why this process was like super interesting. There's some great questions in the chat, by the way. <laughs> I just, there like, are, yeah. I just took a look at like, uh, yeah. There, we'll keep rolling great. along. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there, there's a question about targeting your marketing for orchestras in a very saturated environment. So I know Ottawa has multiple orchestras, um, potentially also the GTA. Um, how do you 
prioritize or, or target what your messaging is? Any particular tips on how to do that in that kind of environment? So I'm, I'll, I'll take this, but from a planning perspective, um, because we did touch on this a lot, and then I, I'll flip it to, to Julie and Kathy. Um, so a, a main thing, uh, and this came up so much. So when we were doing our briefing, like one of the key questions there is, uh, okay, who are you? <laughs> like, who do you, who are you? And so, you know, you think about, well, what would I say? Who would I say we are? So it was a bit about positioning, but then also, you know, how are you unique? And it was such an interesting conversation and it, it, it does, it's not resolved in like in one session, right? We, we kind of would come back to it and then certain words would stick. So, you know, yes, there, there's like, it's unique differentiators. Um, you know, you just kind of got to, you have to work at them to think, okay, is this really unique? Are we really different? I, I would argue that, I, you know, we, we may all think we're a dime a dozen, or there's like a hundred community orchestras, but the, the trick is really to find like, what is it that makes you special? And I can guarantee if you have a conversation about it um, and think about it, it will come out. Um, so I, I don't know if Julie or Kathy want to add to that, but it, it did come out for them. Yeah. Yeah. One of the key things we found was that we were, uh, well, we had basically family members and, and, and friends come to our concerts. So like people that were close to the members of the orchestra, uh, we wanted to go a bit wider. Um, and yeah, so after thinking about who we are, it's like, well, yeah, Donnie has the Ottawa uh, Youth Orchestra. And then, you know, like, oh, we have university students play with us. And then, so it, it sort of built on that. And then, well, maybe we can, you know, go there and see if people are interested either to come play with us or, you know, bring in some audience. And I think that's how we got to it. Exactly what Nicole said, finding out who you are and, and you know, what type of demographic you're, you're looking for. And that helped us a great deal. Yeah. I also thought when we were doing that process, that finding out how we felt, how I, we personally felt about the orchestra and the music, that was probably number one with us, that we really wanted to make sure that that was the best possible. And so striving from that, it was really um, felt good. And to say, yeah, that's what we really are striving for. So that was fun. Thanks, everybody. And this is building on a lot of the learning that we had in our last Festival of Learning session about clarifying your mission, vision, and values. Why are you coming together as an orchestra? And what do you offer? Um, there's yeah. Can I, I'll just add one piece there though too, which is also like personality is really important. So as Julie said, like there's the, there's the, the who we go after or who comes, but personality was, was also a big part of this. So there was much like debate and great conversation around like, what's our personality? Um, and I will say as a, a like neutral observer, um, one of the things that really stood out was that, you know, it's about, it was a combination. It was like, the passion for playing, which clearly I'm sure everybody on this call has, but it was also about like their performances just inherently happen to be a bit, uh, sometimes uh, we don't know what's happening or a bit different and which then led to like, they're quite unique. <laughs> so we played with that, right? And so you can use elements of the personalities um, in your orchestra as well to, to help differentiate. For sure. Thank you. Um, so maybe one more question and, and we'll see if we can get some other ones answered in writing later, but um, just one more for now. Um, so we know that a lot of the audience demographics of orchestras tend to be older. Um, so one person in the chat is wondering if you have a strategy to engage those older demographics in social media, or maybe do you see another reason that you're using social media? Mm -hmm. So I, and uh, maybe I'll, I can see another one in there about LinkedIn. So I'll see if I can squeeze it in. So interestingly, over the passage of time and the launch of the platforms, um, you know, you have to remember, like the platform themselves have a vested interest in who uses it. So what's interesting is that when Facebook launched, um, I think we all know it was launched to, let's say, um, a college level age person. Um, over time, then it actually had much success with older demographics and then younger people started to drop off because the older demographic was starting to take space, right? Like these are all based on just human behaviors. It's, and, and then the platforms and our behavior were kind of following suit. So Facebook is actually going through, as we know, like a very odd time. So keeping that aside, um, one of the things that's interesting about Facebook is that again, from a community standpoint, it's highly used. 
um, regardless, like, and, and all age groups. So I think maybe the, the way to think about it is how you're positioning yourself in Facebook um, and, and positioning it as a community. Um, and then you're going to get a variety of ages on it. Um, you know, again, Instagram, Instagram is fairly broad. Um, so, you know, for an older demographic, I would go back to, well, how integrated is your plan? I mean, social is a piece of it. But again, what is someone's behavior? Like most likely, right? If they go out for walks or they're at community centers or they're traveling, it, it really depends on what someone's behavior is. So your best bet is actually to think about it in an integrated way, which doesn't have to be large. There's no budget here for TV, print, advertising, you know, like that kind of thing. So it really is about the small efforts um, and using connections and relationships to reach, um, at, I would say any age, but in particularly possibly um, an older demographic. But I do a lot of work in se with seniors um, and we're doing, we do a lot of online work um, to ensure connectivity. So again, um, and reduce isolation. So I think there's just, it depends on where you're finding the people um, to do it. And LinkedIn, I would say yes, uh, never underestimate it because even though it's a professional network, it's a professional network of people who have interests. So why not? Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, and thank you, Kathy and Julie. I brought Catherine back up on the virtual stage uh, to close us off. We're at one o'clock. Um, so thank you so much and handing it over to you, Catherine. Okay, uh, so what I'm thinking about is there is no energy crisis uh, with the Ottawa Chamber Orchestra. And what I'm loving <laughs> about the, uh, the, the, the tale that you have unfolded for us is it's a combination of incredibly bright, gifted, creative, committed people being given a structure within which their contributions can have the maximum impact. And I'm, I'm just loving the way in which your work together released uh, the full potential of this pretty amazing group of people. So I feel honored and humbled that you've been part of the Resilient Ontario Orchestra's project, completely delighted at what you've been able to share today. I want to remind our uh, attendees today that materials from the session will be found on our website oc.ca in the coming weeks. I encourage you to join us for the next the coming sessions in the Resilient Ontario Orchestra's project. We're going every Wednesday 12 noon to 1 p.m. Uh, right up until December 8th and uh, feel free to register. We'd love to see you again. And Lauren is just about to paste the feedback survey, uh, which we love to uh, read the results uh, on uh, into the chat and encourage you to complete that. That will help shape our future programming. Uh, we're really interested in your thoughts. But once again, on behalf of all of us, Nicole, Kathy, Julie, um, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for sharing the playbook. Thank you for sharing your journey. And I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.